Bibles this evening to John chapter 10. We have been focusing for the last several services on the shepherd, the true shepherd in contrast to the false shepherds. Tonight we will begin focusing on the sheep. I asked a question this morning and I'd like to repeat it at this time. Are we sheep because we believe? Or do we believe because we are sheep? Now that is very confusing to a lot of people, but it should not be. We want to read tonight the first five verses, and then we'll drop down to verse 22 and read through the 30th verse. We're focusing on the sheep now for a number of services. Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by or through the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by or through the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Verse 22. And it was at Jerusalem the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? Or how long are you going to hold us in suspense? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and ye believed not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. But ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. Now you notice beginning with verse 27, we have really a continuation of, Uh, Verse 4, which we've already read. My sheep hear my voice. Now that's a present active indicative verb. Hear my voice. And I know them. That also is a present active indicative verb. And they follow me, which is another present active indicative verb. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. I said to you this morning that we're going to have a rather long series on the subject of soteriology. Now that's a theological term which simply means the science of salvation. You're going to see the necessity of this study. We're going through the entire gospel according to John, and we will study every reference in John's gospel where there is any reference made to the subject of salvation. There are, erroneous, there are erroneous views taught concerning salvation today. That's why I raised the question a moment ago, once again. Are we sheep because we believe, or do we believe because we are sheep? That's a very important question, and it's imperative that one knows the meaning of the truth of what we're talking about. The 10th chapter of John is an interesting chapter. It serves as a great foundation for this series on the shepherd and his sheep. Although we will be looking at many passages throughout the Gospel of John, 
and we'll be studying some Old Testament passages in connection with this. So it's going to be a rather lengthy series on soteriology in the light of John's teaching. We will consider not only what John has to say on the subject in the Gospel of John, but we will also be looking at his epistles, especially first the first epistle of John, because there are many references to being born of God in 1 John. So we will be going also to his first epistle. The word for sheep is found 26 times, or it is used metaphorically of the sheep 26 times in the New Testament. Fifteen of those times. Now, when you read this chapter, you'll find 17 references. One of them is italicized. That means it has been supplied by the translators. And then in most manuscripts, there is another reference where it is not in most manuscripts. So there are 15 references without question concerning the sheep in this 10th chapter of the Gospel of John. I know of no subject that is more interesting or should be more interesting to God's people than the subject of the shepherd and his sheep. We're going to look at the doctrinal aspect of this subject and we'll get into all the great truths relative to soteriology such as divine election, etc., etc. And no person who is a sheep detests any portion of Scripture. He may not understand, but he doesn't detest any portion of Scripture. No sheep tries to explain away the Word of God. He accepts the Word of God for what it teaches, and the reason being he is a sheep. And then we're going to look at the confidential part. There is a tremendous secret, and I brought this out briefly last Sunday evening from the 25th chapter of the Psalms, or the 25th division of the Psalms. The secret of the Lord belongs to those who fear him. And you find here in the fourth verse, When he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. Why? For they know his voice. And please don't forget, don't ever forget, the verb know here is a perfect tense verb. And so not only do his sheep know him, not only it is, a, is it a completed action in time past, but they are in a continual state of knowing him. The time will never come when God's sheep do not know him. And that's a real blessing. That gives us assurance. So you can see the confidential aspect of the subject. And then finally, the practical aspect. The sheep follow him. The sheep obey him because they recognize his voice. And they will not follow a strange voice because they know not the voice of strangers. Now tonight I'm going to kind of give you an overview of soteriology and what we will be studying for several services. And I think this is a good way to introduce the subject of soteriology or the science of salvation. I want to show you tonight that life precedes faith, L-I-F-E. Spiritual life precedes faith. Most religionists will tell you today that one must believe, and after he believes, or by his believing, he becomes a child of God. That is, he is born again. But folk, that is not the teaching of Scripture. That is not the Word of God. Let me give to you an idea of what we will be doing, first of all. I'd like you to turn with me, first of all, to the first chapter. Now, we're not getting into this tonight, but I want to show you what we'll be doing. Verses 12 and 13 are quoted not only by persons who believe in free grace, but these verses are also quoted by persons who believe in free will. Those who embrace the theory of free will believe that verse 12 is a proof text and that verse 12 tells us how a person is born of God, but that is not the truth. The 13th verse tells us how a person becomes a believer. The very reverse of what some folks say is the truth of the passage. Now, I'm just acquainting you with what we will be studying, but let me give you an idea now. 
Let's read verses 12 and 13. But as many as, but as many as. Now we'll break this down and get into every major point in these two verses in a subsequent lesson, but not tonight. I'm introducing it. As many as received him, to them gave he power. Now there are several words in the Greek used and translated by the word power. The word that is used here simply means authority. It comes from the Greek word exousia, which means authority. It does not come from dunamis, which means power, and the word dunamis, we get our word dynamite from it. So here it simply means authority. As many as received him, to them gave he authority to become the, what's this word, sons. Now that's wrong. It is not sons in the original. The word is techna, not huioi. And we'll get into that later. Become the children of God. So it is for the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. Now watch verse 13. Which were born. Which were born. Now you ought to underscore the two words were born. And then you'll notice he says, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. You take the two words in the first part of the text, were born, and the last two words, were born of God. And of God is a very important statement. In other words, we're born of God. So it is a passive voice verb. That means that the recipient does not participate in this experience, and it really is an experience. Conversion is an experience. Of course, we have experiences as a result of it. But the new birth, being quickened by God, is done instantaneously by the Holy Spirit. And the individual upon whom the Holy Spirit operates, applying the finished work of Jesus Christ to his or her heart, that person is passive. That person is not active. He's not participating in the action of the new birth. So born of God. Now verse 12 speaks of conversion. Conversion. Becoming the children of God. Verse 13 refers to regeneration, the cause of conversion. And in regeneration, the subject is passive, as I've already stated. But in conversion, the subject is active. God doesn't repent for the individual. He doesn't believe for the individual. It is by the life which is imparted in regeneration that enables the person to repent and to believe. God doesn't repent. He doesn't believe for us. So you're going to see why we're stressing life precedes faith. And we'll get into that in a moment. And then I want you to turn to the 29th verse of this first chapter. We'll be spending one lesson, and I may get in it, into it to some extent this evening. John 1, 29 is greatly misunderstood. It is greatly misinterpreted today. And the reason I'm going to spend the time in doing this before we get through with the study of soteriology and the Gospel of John, you'll have no doubt in your mind that life precedes faith. That salvation in the sense of regeneration of the new birth is all of God. But look at verse 29, and I want to point out a few things as we look at the text. The next day John seeth Jesus coming and this is a present middle participle, coming unto him. The Lord Jesus was coming. He was participating in the action. And saith, Behold. Behold. Now the Greek word used here and translated behold, we could use another word and it actually is a better word. Look. Look. So John is saying, Look. The Lamb of God, now watch this, which taketh away the sin of the world. The verb taketh in this verse is a present active participle. Present active participle. 
So you can read it like this. Look, the Lamb of God who is taking away the sin of the world. Who is taking away the sin of the world. Now we'll get into that more later. Now let me also state this. We see in the first chapter of the Gospel of John, and I'm sure you realize by this time as a believer in Christ that John's Gospel is the most profound of all of the Gospel writers. It's the most profound. So we see in John's Gospel, and especially in this first chapter, the purpose and activity of grace. The purpose and activity of grace. Christ came not merely to expose the world's darkness, as we have in the first verses of this chapter, but to reveal the Father in verse 18. Since there is no capacity in the natural man to receive light from God, the ability must come from the activity of the sovereign God in grace. And this is what we have. Christ could not be at home in this world, but there would be a little company, a little company, called in the scriptures like Luke 12, 32, a little flock, a little company, and they are referred to as his sheep, his sheep, among whom he could tabernacle. And I'd like to give you this because we have three names mentioned and the meaning of their names give to you and me a tremendous lesson in this first chapter. The company is symbolized, first of all, by John. John's name means affection, affection. What I'm showing you is that the sheep have affection for the shepherd. They have affection for the shepherd. So John's name symbolizes affection. And then secondly, we have Andrew. Andrew's name means testimony. He stands not only for testimony, but also for service. Those who have affection for the shepherd, now notice what I'm saying, those who have affection for the shepherd have a testimony for the shepherd, and also they're willing to serve the shepherd. They obey the shepherd's voice. And finally, we have Peter. And Peter refers to the structure of living stones. His name means a little pebble, a little rock, or a detached piece of rock. So the church was not built upon the detached piece of rock of Matthew 16, 18. Upon this rock I'll build my church. The Roman Catholics teach that the church was built upon Peter, but I must tell you that is not so. The church was not built upon poor, vacillating Peter. He was just a detached piece of rock, but he does stand for the structure, the structure of living stones. Now, such is the company that is now being gathered out of the world by the grace of the sovereign God. This carries us outside the range of everything that is of man. So we have John affection, Andrew, testimony and service, and Peter, the structure of living stones. Living stones. Now, we'll be looking at verse 29. And then, of course, in the last verses of uh, chapter 2, verses 23 through 25, and I'm going to have to stop in a moment and get to our lesson, but I want to show you what we'll be doing, going to the very first of the epistle, going all the way through the gospel according to John. In verse 23 of chapter 2, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name. Many believed in his name. Now this is an aerist active indicative verb. That means point action past time. They believed in his name. When they saw the miracles which he did, and which he did is an imperfect verb, and so it could read like this, which he was doing. He was doing. He was still continuing to do works and perform miracles. Verse 24. Now this is chapter 2. But Jesus did not commit 
And that too is an imperfect verb. He did not commit himself unto them. Why? Because he knew all. He knew all. Verse 25, And needed not that any should testify of man, for he knew what was in man. Now, all of us are familiar with the first 16 verses, especially. In fact, most Christians can quote these 16 verses from memory. Yet I want to tell you tonight that this passage is used more and abused worse concerning the subject of salvation than any other one passage in all the Bible. I want to show you tonight from this passage. This passage teaches that life precedes faith. L-I-F-E precedes faith. And I can prove it. Well, let's begin because I'm going to use this as a basis this evening. And so we'll begin our discussion now of the subject entitled, Life Precedes Faith. This is our introduction to the series on Soteriology, the Science of Salvation. Now, those who believe in free will today, and having said that, I got a letter. I tried to go through all the mail this afternoon before I took a siesta. And I had a letter from a retired professor of the charismatic movement. And of course, he took exceptions to our article in the paper. And I could certainly understand that. I expected that when I wrote the article and had it, had it printed. And we'll get the opposition from a lot of corners of the religious community. But he took exceptions, first of all, uh, to the impeccability of Christ. He believed in impeccability. And, of course, I would stop right there. I, I have nothing else to say to a person. If he denies the impeccability of Jesus Christ, there is no basis for any further discussion, period. And he also believed in free will, so he was opposed to what I had to say about the will. And so he went into that. And he also let me know that he believed in apostasy. A person could be saved today and lost tomorrow, which is contrary to Scripture. So when we get through studying this subject of soteriology, what God begins, he is capable of fulfilling and bringing it to a completion. So life precedes faith. Now, Arminians declare, in triumphant tone, I might say, that faith precedes the new birth. And they use John 3 as a basis, as well as John 1, 12, and that's why I read the verse to you a moment ago. And they believe that John 1, 12 tells how a person is born again. They believe that in John chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, we're told how a person is born again. I want to give you some points tonight, in just a few minutes, from John 3 that may be rather shocking to you, but they cannot be refuted in the light of the context. And as sheep of God's pasture, we want to know the truth. We want the whole truth. We don't want part of the truth. Now, I said that Arminians declare in triumphant tone that faith is the cause of the new birth. Scripture, on the other hand, affirms that life precedes faith. Life precedes faith. Religionists hate the doctrine of regeneration by the Spirit of God. And the reason they hate the doctrine is because it puts man in the dust at the feet of the Sovereign Savior. The Arminian has such an exalted opinion of himself, and I want to give a quote here, that he thinks it is his act, his act of faith, and I'm talking now about human faith, that determines the act of God in imparting the principle of life. Isn't that a tragedy? Isn't that a tragedy? One thing must be established at the very outset by you and me. What is it? There is no inner light, L-I-G-H-T, or revelation given above that which is written. What God has said to you and me stands written. 
it will always stand written. It is settled in heaven. It is not to be added to, neither it is, is it to be detracted from. It is God's complete revelation to his people, the sheep. Now, we recognize the fact that those who believe in free will can quote Scripture. And we have to consider the Scriptures that are quoted. Those who believe in free grace also quote Scriptures. But there is no contradiction between the Scriptures quoted by the Arminian and by the person who believes in free grace if he takes all the Scriptures and studies them in the light of the context. We would not be foolish enough to say that the Bible teaches that one believes before he is regenerated. The Bible teaches that and then turn right around and say, and the Bible also teaches that a person is regenerated before he believes. Both things cannot be true, folk. Now, if what I'm saying tonight is not true, if I cannot prove it from the Scriptures, we'd better back up. We'd better take another look, but I'm not worried about it. And you won't be worried about it either. And you will not be confused when you witness to people who are not students of the Scriptures, but who have their own prejudices and their own opinions concerning what the Bible teaches. I'm going to make this as simple as I can tonight, but we're going to get into a little depth, so stay with me and take some notes. My first point is there is life. There is life in the subjective sense. There is life in the subjective sense. And then secondly, there is life in the objective sense. And thirdly, there is no contradiction between life in the subjective sense and in the objective sense. You say, well, I'm not sure that I understand what you're talking about. Stay with me and I'll explain it. And then I'll illustrate it by the scriptures tonight. So we're looking, first of all, at life in the subjective sense. Now, when I refer to life in the subjective sense, I am referring to the impartation of life by the Holy Spirit in regeneration or in the new birth. In the new birth. There is nothing of this I will if you will. Watch what I'm saying. There is nothing of this I will if you will. In other words, God is not saying, I'll do something for you if you'll do something. There's none of that in what I'm talking about now, subjective life. Secondly, there is nothing of proposal, of proposal. Thirdly, there is nothing of an offer. There is nothing of a condition on the part of man. Nothing of a condition on the part of man. <clears throat> God just simply speaks and there is life. A tremendous Old Testament example of this is Ezekiel 16, 6 and 8. God spoke and there was life. He just simply spoke and there was life. And you have the same thing here in John chapter 3 and verse 8. And we'll look at it again in a few minutes. So life in the subjective sense produces faith. I said life in the subjective sense produces faith. In other words, you must possess spiritual life in order to have faith. Now I'll prove that to you from John 3. Look at verse 8. Then I want to give you some things from John 3 before we get through. Notice what our Lord said to Nicodemus. The wind bloweth. Where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth, so is every one that is born, that is born, watch that verb, and I would beg you, beloved, to make a note here, which is born of the Spirit. Notice, born of the Spirit. Now let's look at this for a few minutes. The present born again phenomenon. In the religious world today is used really to cover up heresy. Now, I make no apology for this. I said the present day born again phenomenon 
made very popular in the world by our former president, Jimmy Carter, and Colson, and of course others. So the present-day phenomenon, born-again phenomenon, is simply a cover-up of heresy that is being taught. Now let me prove my point. I want to give to you at this time seven things, and I'd like you to write them down, as you consider the first eight verses of John chapter 3. And you're familiar with this chapter, so we're not going to spend a lot of time reading it. I'll call attention. This is Christ's discourse with Nicodemus. Now, the first thing I want you to observe is this. Scripture terminology is used by religionists. I said Scripture terminology is used by religionists to teach the opposite, the opposite of what Scripture actually teaches. Now, you take that thought down and remember it because I'll be amplifying it in days to come. Number two, modern-day evangelicals promote crowd psychology. They're promoters of crowd psychology. I don't believe in that. Not at all. And I want you to know, even for years when I was in the Southern Baptist Convention, I didn't believe in that. And I used to wonder when I'd be asked to speak in an in evangelistic conference or something, or in a church, and I would not do the things that most evangelists did. And I could tell right quick that the people didn't appreciate it because they were always looking for results. Results. Any way you can get them, get results. So modern-day evangelicals promote crowd psychology. Both preachers and people do something. Watch this. Both preachers and people do something, but God has done absolutely nothing in the lives of most of them. And the fruits prove that, and you know it to be true. There is no evidence of the miracle of regeneration or the new birth in the lives of most people who are moved by mob psychology. For instance, like the Billy Graham campaigns. There's an illustration of it. Number three. Now notice what Christ said to Nicodemus. Christ said to Nicodemus, You must be born from above. Let's look at verse 3 and verse 5. We'll read verses 3 through 5, and I want you to get the inflected form as we conjugate the verbs here. In verse 3, Jesus answered and said unto him, Nicodemus, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again. This is an Arius passive subjunctive. Areas, passive, subjunctive. And it literally means born from above. Instead of again, from above. Then verse 4. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born? Be born. When he is old, can he enter the second time into his mother's womb and be born? Be born, in both instances here, are areas passive infinitive form of genao. And now notice verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born. Be born. In verse 5. And here we have an areas passive subjunctive of water and spirit. Notice the preposition of is italicized. It isn't in the original. Just omit it. Be born of water and spirit, or and the spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Read on through verse 7. That which is born, and this is a perfect passive participle here, of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born, and this is a perfect passive participle, of the spirit is spirit. Notice the passive voice in every one of them here. The passive voice. And then in verse 7, Marvel not that I said unto thee, Ye must be born. Ye must be born again or from above. Now, what did I say? Number three, 
Christ said to Nicodemus, you must be born from above. It is only a statement of fact. That's all it is. Jesus Christ was not telling Nicodemus how he could be born again. Does that surprise you? He was not telling him how he could be born again. He just made a statement of fact. So nothing is said about a decision here. Watch this. Nothing is said about a decision for Christ. Nothing is said about faith. And nothing is said about repentance. The Lord just simply made a statement of fact. Nicodemus, you must be born from above. This was not a command to be obeyed. Watch that. It's not an imperative. It's not a command. So our Lord did not give a command. There isn't anything about a decision. There isn't anything about faith. There isn't anything about repentance. It is only a statement of fact made by Jesus Christ to Nicodemus. Now, folk, this can't be denied. This is not a matter of interpretation. We're just laying it out as it is in the Greek grammar. Now let's go a little further. So the imperative is never used with a new birth. And when I use the word imperative, that means a command. The command is never used in reference to the new birth or being born from above. Why? Because it is wholly the act of the sovereign God. It's wholly His. You don't participate in it. No one participates in the new birth any more than you participated in your conception in the mother's womb. So watch this. Nicodemus was not told to do anything. Do you know why this is so diff difficult for people today? Is because of all of the things that they have been taught through the years been brainwashed by tradition instead of looking at the book for what it says. And then when a person has been taught something for years, like a person who's been raised a Methodist or a Baptist or a Lutheran or something else, well, I don't want to hear anything other than what a Baptist says or a Lutheran says or somebody else. I want to know what the book says. I want to know what God says. When I stand before the Lord, I can't say, well, I was taught this or that. I am responsible for what God said. That makes sense, doesn't it? So Nicodemus was not told to do anything here thus far, was he? Verses 1 through 7. It was only a statement of fact. The new birth is something that God alone can accomplish. That God alone can accomplish. Then number four, Christ gave no instruction whatsoever on how to be born again or to be born from above. It isn't here. He used no manipulative tricks, watch this, but showed that the new birth is the miraculous work of the Holy Spirit. Now look at verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof. But canst not tell from whence it cometh, or whither it goeth, so is every one that is born of the Spirit. <clears throat> then number five. If the new birth was contingent upon the sinner first desiring God, watch this. If the new birth were contingent upon the sinner first desiring God, I'm here to tell you that no one would ever be born of God. Can you prove that? I wouldn't have said it if I can't. Turn with me to Romans chapter 3, please. We have 14 horrible indictments given against every person who comes into this world. He's a depraved individual. And let's listen to what the Word of God says. Let's begin with verse 9. What then? Paul said, Are we better than they? No, in no wise. For we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they're all under sin. As it is written, 
You know, let me stop here for a moment. Several months ago, and I haven't shared this with you yet, but I'm going to get into eschatology someday again. And when I do, I'm going to get into it on the basis of it is written. I had one of the most fascinating studies here months ago that I got into, going through the New Testament and observing the statement, it is written. When you go back to Matthew chapter 2 and carry all the way through the New Testament, as it is written, as it is written, it is a perfect passive indicative verb. Notice, perfect passive indicative verb. And it literally means, it stands written. It stands written. So as it is written, Paul says, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. Now watch this. There is none that seeketh after God. Now what did I say? I stated that if the new birth was contingent upon the sinner first desiring God, no one would ever be born from above. Because no one in his depraved condition desires God. No one in his depraved condition seeks after God. God is the one who seeks us. And we seek him because he first sought us. And we love him because he first loved us. Let's don't get the cart before the horse. Let's keep it in the biblical order. Number six. Since the new birth is of God... And we have seen that in verse 3, in verse 5, in verse 8, also verse 7. So since the new birth is of God, he cannot be manipulated by man. That is, God cannot be manipulated by man in being born of God. Go back to the first chapter. Look at verse 13 again. I said, God cannot be manipulated by man in being born from above. Verse 13 proves it. Which were born, first of all, not of blood. Actually, in the Greek, the word is plural, not of bloods. I'll get into more about that later. But it's plural. It's a plural word, bloods. Not of bloods. Nor of the will of the flesh. Nor of the will of man. God cannot be manipulated by man concerning the subject of the new birth, but of God. See, this can't be refuted. This is plain as plain as it can be. And finally, number seven, the truth of the gospel can be preached with confidence. Do you know why that I can preach the truth of God with such confidence? I know that there are some sheep that have not been brought into the fold as yet. If that were not true, the Lord Jesus Christ would already have come. But we're told in 2 Peter 3 and verse 15, the long-suffering of God is salvation. Is salvation to whom? To the elect, going back to the ninth verse. The long-suffering of God is salvation. I'm thankful for the long-suffering of God. And he will remain long-suffering until everyone for whom Jesus Christ died is safely brought into the ark of safety. Christ didn't die in vain, folks. He did not die in vain. So the truth of the gospel can be preached with confidence, confidence, knowing that the word will go forth and accomplish the purpose for which God sends it. But now let's notice... We're talking about subjective life. There is life in the subjective sense. So life in the subjective sense produces faith. Now when you leave the 8th verse of John 3, and you go on and beginning with the 14th verse, you get into the subject of faith. But it is the new birth. It is life that produces the faith that is exercised in embracing Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Now, I'm not going to leave anything out. So the order we are contending for is the relation between cause and effect. I want you to see how simple it is. Cause and effect. Why does a person believe? It's because he has life. 
It's because he has life. Faith is the gift of God. Faith is the fruit of regeneration. All that were ordained to eternal life shall believe. Acts 13, 48. That's the book of God. That's the word. So the order we are to contend for is the relation between cause and effect. Now watch this closely. We're still on the subjective life. Subjective life. The sinner is dead in a twofold sense. Now, you need to take a note on this. The sinner is dead in a twofold sense. Number one, he is unable of himself to see. John 3 3. He can't see the kingdom. So he is unable of himself to see. In verse 5, he is unable to enter the kingdom. In John 6, 44, he is unable to come to Christ. He's unable to come. In John 14, 17, he's unable to receive. In John 8, 43 and 47, he is unable to hear. You see, hearing with the organ of the ear. And really hearing and understand spiritual things, two different things. He is unable to understand, 1 Corinthians 2.14. And he is unable to cease, watch this one, to cease from sin, 2 Peter 2.14. Now watch this. I said the sinner is dead in a twofold sense. Number one, he is unable in himself to see to enter, to come, to receive, to hear, to understand, and to cease from sin. And I gave you scripture on all of those. That's Bible. I'm not making up something. And secondly, the sentence of death, the sentence of death has been passed upon him, Ephesians 2, 1 through 3. So he is dead in a twofold sense. He's unable, and the sentence of death has passed upon him. And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and in sin. Now, without subjective life, watch this, without subjective life, it is impossible to believe the objective message of Jesus Christ. If you and I don't possess subjective life, we cannot believe the objective message. The objective message will not mean anything to us. That's why folk can go to church and sit there and the preacher can preach the truth, the glorious truth that sheep listen to. I'm talking about saved sheep now. I'm talking about born-again sheep. Not lost sheep, but saved sheep. And they rejoice, they recognize the voice, and they're thrilled to death with what they hear because it's the voice of their shepherd. And others can sit there if they have not been regenerated. And what is being said doesn't mean a thing. I know from experience and so do you. Before my wife and I got married, in order to be with her, I'd go to church with her. Didn't mean anything to me. I was a church, lost church member. Well, she was a lost Methodist at that time and I was a lost Baptist. And so I'd go and I'd sit there. I didn't get anything out of the service. I went so I could be with her. But I tell you, it was different. After my regeneration and then a glorious conversion experience, I had a desire for the Word of God, a hunger for the Word of God, and it never has ceased. It intensifies every day of my life. I can't get enough of it. It's the infinite mind of God. I have a meat that the world doesn't know anything about. It's satisfying. But without subjective life, we cannot embrace and believe the objective truth concerning Christ. Surely that can be understood. When a person is regenerated... It is impossible for the person not to believe 
Now watch what I'm saying. It is impossible for an unregenerated person to believe, and it's impossible for a regenerated person not to believe. Not to believe. And what a glorious thing it is to believe and to embrace Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So regeneration is solely the act of God. Faith is the act of the regenerated person in the power of the new life that has been imparted by the grace of God. Now, we've been talking about subjective life. Secondly, there is life in the objective sense. We've talked about subjective life, but there is life in the objective sense. Now, watch this. Don't be confused. Watch it. Life, this is life in the judicial sense. In the judicial sense. And don't forget the word judicial. The verses to be considered in this sense are John 3, 14 through 16. That's why I'm giving it. Also the 18th verse and the 36th verse of John chapter 3. John 5, 24. Galatians 3, 26. Acts 16, through 30, 16, 31. There are others, but these will suffice. This is life in the objective sense. This is life in the judicial sense. Let me explain it if I can. This is the repentant sinner, the repentant sinner embracing, embracing the Lord Jesus Christ. Embracing the objective message, as it is declared, of Christ's redemptive work through the glorious gospel of the blessed Son of God. In this aspect of life, we have the subjective spirit. Watch this. In this aspect of life, we have the subjective spirit embracing the objective fact of Christ, of Christ's incarnation, 1 John 4, 1 through 4, the historical record of Christ, 1 John 5, 9 through 13. And you'll want to study these later. The finished work of Christ on the cross, John 3, 14 through 16. He must be lifted up. And on through the 16th verse. His resurrection out from among the dead, John 21 through 10 and 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And finally, His glorious coming again, Acts chapter 1, verses 9 through 11. Now let me go through that with you again because I want you to see the beauty of it. I said, in this aspect of life, that we're talking about the objective aspect of life now. We have the subjective spirit, the Holy Spirit, the spirit of regeneration within us, embracing the objective fact of Christ's incarnation. And when you talk about Christ's incarnation, I want you to know you're going to talk about the person of the incarnation. So that gets into the person of the incarnation. And that's found in... 1 John 4, 1 through 4. Then the historical record of Christ in the fifth chapter, 1 John 9 through 13. The finished work of Christ on the cross, John 3, 14 through 16. His resurrection out from among the dead, John 20, 1 through 10. And His glorious coming again, Acts 1, 9 through 11. That's the objective message. And what a message it is to you and me. Now, being born again and believing are two different things. Watch this. Being born again and believing are two different things. They both happen to every person who is saved. I say they happen to every person who is saved, but they are completely different aspects of life. The subjective and the objective the subjective and the objective. So, the subjective must precede the objective. If the subjective doesn't precede the objective, you cannot believe, you cannot embrace the objective. So,
So I'll say it like this. The subjective must precede the objective in the application of life to the elect or to the sheep for whom Christ died. However, the objective precedes the subjective. Watch this now. The objective precedes the subjective from God's point of view. From God's point of view. Not from yours, but from God's. Therefore, being born again and believing are two different things. They both happen to every person who is saved. But they're completely different aspects of life. The first... Now, let me illustrate it. I'm going to give several illustrations of this. Copy these down, please. Let me illustrate this point. I said there are different aspects of life. The first is subjective. The second is objective. That's number one. Number two, the first is impartation. Impartation. And the second is imputation. So you have to know the difference between impartation and imputation. And I can't preach on imputation tonight. I have preached on it at length in the past, but I can't tonight. The first is actual. The subjective is actual. It's actual. And the second is judicial. The first has to do with one's inward state. I'm a new creature in Christ Jesus. The second has to do with one's knowledge of his standing his outward standing before God. Now, folk, that includes it all. I like to run that back by. I realize that this is doctrinal, and we're getting a little deep, but I want to give it to you again. I want you to be sure to get this point because of its importance, and it's wrapping it all up. So I said being born again and believing are two different things. There is a difference between subjective life and objective life. And now I'll give them again. The first is subjective. That's regeneration. That's the new birth. That's being born from above. That's being quickened by God. That's having the life of God. So that's subjective. The second is objective. That's the message of God. That's objective. The first is actual. It's actual. And the second is judicial. The first is impartation. The second is imputation. And the first has to do with one's inward state. And the second has to do with one's knowledge of his outward standing before God. Surely you know the difference between standing and state. Standing and state. Position and condition. Now, religionists think that the sinner takes the first step. But there is not a word of truth in that. The sinner does not take this first step. The sinner cannot take the first step. If you saw a person in a casket, a dead person, you know he can't take a step. But he's physically dead. But the unbeliever, the unregenerate person, is dead spiritually. And being dead spiritually, he cannot take one step spiritually. He cannot take one step toward God. No wonder. The Lord Jesus said, No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now let's look lastly. The distinction we have made was given us by the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 3, verses 8 through 16. So in the eighth verse we have the subjective life, being born of God, passive voice. The recipient does not participate in the action any more than the person conceived in the womb participated in the conception. That's the work of God. And then when we come to verses 14 through 16, we have the objective. Now watch this. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now there we have the objective. So we have both subjective and objective. And this distinction is in harmony. Watch this. This distinction is in harmony 
with depravity, and the Bible teaches depravity. It is in harmony with the effectual call. Now, having said that, go to John 10 for a moment. Go to John 10. Let's look at it again. I want you to know we're not just roving around and not interpreting the Scriptures or giving an exposition. Look at verses 3 and 4. The contrast between the true shepherd and the false shepherds. To him, the porter openeth, that is, the true shepherd, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own by name. Folk, that's the effectual call. That's the effectual call. He calls his own by name. I said, when we understand the distinction between subjective life and objective life, and the Lord gives us the distinction here in John 3, 8 through 16, and this distinction is in harmony with depravity. It's in harmony with the effectual call. For nearly 20 years, I never heard the call. Even though I went to church a number of times, I never heard the call. But after one and I were married, about nine months passed. I was regenerated. I knew something had happened to me. We went to a service. We had the desire to go, and it was the inward life that gave me and gave her the desire to go. And the preacher preached the gospel, and I heard the effectual call. And what did I do? I embraced Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So this distinction is in harmony with depravity. It's in harmony with the effectual call. And it's in harmony with God's absolute sovereignty. I'll give you this in conclusion. The Bible order is given us in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Turn with me to amplify this in closing. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 2 give you a biblical example of this tremendous truth. We'll read, beginning with verse 1, and read through verse 3. But we'll zero in on verse 2. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now verse 2. Elect. Don't be afraid of that word. That's a Bible word. Any time a religionist gets angry over that word, he just needs what he doesn't have. I said he needs what he doesn't have. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us, hath begotten us again unto a living hope, livelier living hope, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And we'll go ahead. To an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. But now look at verse 2. The Bible order is given in verse 2. Number 1, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. That's point number 1. And it means to be chosen, to be chosen by the Father. So God's foreknowledge that is spoken of here actually has the sense of foreordination. Foreordination. And then number 2, Notice God's choice takes effect through the activity of the Holy Spirit. Watch this. The choice is mentioned in the first part of the text. And then this choice of the Father takes effect through the activity of the Holy Spirit. He says, by the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. And this is subjective, folks. This is subjective. We have the election of the Father, subjective life in time. Now notice the third. Election or choosing by the Father and positional sanctification by the Holy Spirit. And notice I said positional sanctification. Now we're talking about condition. Now we're talking about position. And this is 
subjective life. So election by the Father and positional sanctification by the Spirit is unto obedience. Unto obedience. Watch that. You know, I want to stop right there. I remember very well when I was in the Southern Baptist Convention. You'd have people who'd make professions of faith and they'd put stress, you know, on the preachers to get all of those who'd made professions of faith baptized so you could tell how many you baptized for the year. I knew that was just as rotten as it could be. I want to tell you something. You don't have to twist anybody's arm to obey the Lord when he has subjective life. You don't have to beg him to be baptized, and that's the first act of obedience of one who has passed from death into life. You don't have to beg him to go to church. I used to get so sick and tired, you know, of the of the program that they had, and and they go and they want you to put on a campaign, you know, to pledge to give so much money. Did you know? Twenty-five years ago, we stopped taking up offerings. We've never taken up an offering since. And this church has never been in a financial bind since we quit. I don't want people's money who are not regenerated. Furthermore, I'll get their money, that is, the Lord will get it, when they are regenerated. So watch it. Now let's look at these three things again because here it is. It's laid out for us as plain as daylight. So number one, elect according to the foreknowledge of God or the foreordination of God. Number two, God's choice takes effect through the activity of the Holy Spirit being sanctified. Sanctification by or through the sanctification of the Spirit. And then thirdly, election by the Father and positional sanctification by the Spirit is unto obedience. I love to obey the Lord. It's a privilege to be obedient. I'm grateful that I'm a slave of Jesus Christ. I was a slave of the devil too long. I'm a bond slave. Doulos is the word. I'm a slave of Christ. That you may obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with His blood. This is objective. Those who obey not the gospel... We're not elected. In 2 Thessalonians 1.8, those who obeyed not the gospel were not elected and therefore never regenerated. All the elect will be regenerated and all the elect will obey the gospel. It's just that simple. That's why I can preach with confidence. If I didn't believe this message, I could be the most disillusioned person in the world. You remember me telling you this morning about the preacher that wrote me last week and I'm going to call him and talk to him. He's trying to teach the book of Ephesians now to his people and they're rebelling over the doctrine of election. And they raised this question. He wanted some help on it. Well, what about missions? What about missions? And they're asking some of the most foolish questions. I'll be happy to talk to him about it. To give him what help I can. I don't know what age person he is. I don't know how long he's been in the ministry. But he has come to the knowledge of the doctrines of grace and he's trying to teach them and the people are rebelling. They're rebelling. You see, when you know the truth, you don't have to worry. You and I are to go and preach the gospel. The gospel is to be preached. I'm not to do the discriminating. The Holy Spirit does the discriminating. I just preach. I don't know who the elect are. You don't know who the elect are. And the elect themselves don't know it until they have been regenerated by the Spirit of God and given a desire for the things of God. But I'll tell you one thing for sure. The Word is going to accomplish the purpose for which it is set. So here we have the order. Do you see the difference now between subjective and objective? 
And these things are clearly established in the Word of God. And here's a tremendous biblical example in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Now, what have I done? Turn back to John chapter 10 for two or three statements in conclusion. John chapter 10. Now, I want you to see why we're doing this. Let's look at verses 3 and 4 again. The true shepherd entered in lawfully into the sheepfold, which was Judaism, to lead out, to save, to call out the elected ones within the elected nation. And he is the true shepherd of the sheep who entered in the lawful manner. In in verse 3. And this is interesting in verse 3. All four verbs here are present active indicative verbs. To him the porter openeth. That's a present active indicative verb. And the sheep here, another present active indicative verb. And by the way, to talk about the indicative, that means the, the mood of reality. So to him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth, that's another present active indicative, calleth, this is the effectual call, his own sheep by name, and leadeth them, that's another present active indicative, or leadeth them out, that is of Judaism. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, he is the captain of our salvation, leading many sons to glory. Hebrews 2.10 He goeth before them, and the sheep follow him. Follow him. For they know his voice. Now, we're going to get into that because here you get into the confidential. How does the sheep really know his voice? Surely you'd want to go into that, wouldn't you? You'd want to really dig into that, wouldn't you? We're going to show from the Scriptures what it really means, and that's the confidential part. Every sheep can know that's confidential. The goats will never know anything about it. They know His voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from the voice of strangers. Why? Because they know not the voice of strangers. Folk, it doesn't give me a big head. It is the most humbling thing in the world to know that you know that you know the Lord whom to know is life eternal. And you know it's not of you, but it's of the Lord. It is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. Let us stand. Joe, will you come and lead us?